on week seven of our Galatians series entitled Forsaking Religion, Embracing Relationship. And the title of this week's lesson is Living Free in Christ. And we're going to go over Galatians chapter five. I love Galatians chapter five because, because when you start learning to break, about grace, sometimes there's some confusion about um, people will begin to say, well, does that mean that we can just live any way we want to? God's still going to love us. We're still righteous. But Galatians chapter 5 actually shows us the fruit of a, of a believer's life who's living in the freedom that they have in Christ. It is so good. I mean, if you take the full gospel of grace to its fullness, it actually transforms our hearts and causes the fruit of Jesus to come out in our lives. That's really the true gospel of grace. I, I want to I start by reading these verses, Galatians 4, 30 and 31. It's the last two verses of the chapter right before chapter 5. And it says, but what does the scripture say? Cast out and send away the slave woman and her son. For never shall the son of the slave woman be heir and share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. So brethren, we are not children of a slave woman, but of the free. So this, these scriptures are saying that those who live like a slave will never enjoy the inheritance of the free. And what is the inheritance? Romans chapter 8 gives a really clear picture of what the inheritance as believers that we have. It's the glory of God. The glory of God is our inheritance. If you've ever wondered, what is our inheritance? You see that word a lot in Scripture. It's the glory of God. And the glory of God is simply God's good opinion of you, and it's His nature. It's His nature. It's who God is in you. So the, when he says that your inheritance is his glory, he's giving you who he is. He's giving you his righteousness, his joy, his peace, his kindness, his um, patience and self-control, his provision, his power, his victory. That's the glory of God. It's who God is. And it's as children of the free, we enjoy or experience the inheritance. But if you're going to live like a slave, what we learned last week, a slave is simply someone who is trying to earn God's favor. Someone who is depending on themselves to be good enough for God to bless them. And when you live depending on your own effort and your own strength, you live as a slave. A slave to fear, condemnation, guilt, shame, and you never experience the freedom that Jesus purchased for you. So, the, you know, I love this, that from way back in the Garden of Eden, the Father gave Adam and Eve a choice. They could live by their own effort, their own opinion, their own way, or they can live in the Father's opinion and trust what the Father says and live in His love. Isn't that true? And today's no different. Today we get to decide, are we going to live like a slave? Are we going to live and enjoy the inheritance of the free? And if you're living like a slave, it just means you have your eyes focused on yourself. If you're living like a free woman, a free man, a free child in Jesus, it means you got your focus on Jesus. It's that simple. And so the next verse, chapter 5, goes in to say, since you are a free it says, so brethren, we are not children of a slave woman, but of the free. We are free. Have you ever been a child of God and, and didn't live like you were free? The Apostle Paul continues to remind us, you're free. You're free. Remember that you're free. You're free from fear. You're free from condemnation. You're free from guilt. You're free from trying to earn God's favor. You're free. You're free. You're, you're a free child of God. And it's not based on anything that you've done. It doesn't have anything to do with your effort or your strength. 
It has to do with Jesus and his gift of righteousness to you. So once he says to us, it reminds us that we're children of the free. In, in Roman, I mean Galatians 5 verse 1, he says, In this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held and snared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. The, t- the, the caption here in the notes is, you will either live free in Christ or you will live as a slave to the law. In this freedom that Christ has made us free and completely liberate us, stand fast then. What, what does that mean, stand fast then? It means that there's something you've got to pay attention to. There's something you've got to be cautious of. There's something you've got to be aware of. There are going to be people they are going to try to put you back underneath the yoke of bondage, saying it has to do with you and what you need to do in order for God to bless you. Now that you're free in Christ and you know that you're already blessed and you're already righteous and you're already favored, don't let anybody take you back into slavery by telling you that you have to add something to the finished work of Jesus. Stand fast then. Uh, you know, I said this last week, but, you know, once you understand who you are in Christ, once you really embrace the truth that you do not have to add anything to what Jesus did, in order for God to move in your life, for his power to, to bring peace in your relationships, in your marriage, provision in your finances, walk in peace and joy in your life, it all has to do with receiving what Jesus has already provided. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to try to figure out how do I get this or what do I have to do to to be pleasing to God. No longer you have to think that way. When you find yourself in a troubling situation, when you find yourself in a, a situation like Sherry this morning, not having her blow dryer, and it was causing her a little bit of grief and, and anger and frustration that rise, rise up inside of her. When you find yourself in a situation like that, we have a choice. We can have either live in our own effort, in our own mind, in our own way of thinking, or we can turn to Jesus and experience our inheritance. What is Sherry's inheritance? Peace. Her inheritance, Sherry's inheritance, is that she would live this whole day in joy and peace and love. That's her inheritance. But whether or not she is experiencing that inheritance depends on whether she focuses on herself, her own effort, her husband, or whether she focuses on Jesus and what Jesus says and who she is in Jesus and and look into Jesus for strength. It's amazing to me. I, you know, the, the teaching grace all these years and hearing people say, you know, perverting the gospel of grace and saying that somehow it is a license to just live in sin and people being okay with living in sin. I didn't journey out of the law into grace to have an excuse to live in sin. I, I wanted out of the law and into grace so I could live free. So I could truly, my life could truly reflect Jesus. That's the desire of my heart. It's been the longing of my soul ever since I was a little girl. I wanted to be good. Why did I want to be good? Because I had Jesus inside of me. He'd given me a nature that I was good. I just didn't know that it didn't come by the law. It came by the gift. And, And so... The grace of God, when you're truly living in the grace of God, you're not in bondage to sin. You're not. The grace is the power to break free. The Father is in Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They are strong enough in you to overcome anything, any temptation this life can throw at us. Right? There is no temptation to be angry, frustrated, fearful, condemned, feel guilty. Those are all temptations that come at us, but there is none. There is no temptation that God's strength and power cannot enable you to walk free from. It's just a matter of sticking close to Jesus. Union and communion with the one who loves you 
It's not about trying to follow certain steps and rules and regulations that religion would put on us. It's about living in a, it's living in a personal, relying, depending relationship with Jesus. So now that you've learned the freedom of looking to Jesus and that you can experience a life of joy and peace and love, don't go back. Don't let anybody enslave you. Don't let anybody enslave you by telling you you're not good enough. By telling you that, you know, that this is the reason why it's not working for you. Don't let anybody tell you that. This is the, this is the way when you live in the peace of God, when you live understanding the Father's love, when you face challenges as we all do, you are never going to arrive at a point in your life where you don't have any challenges anymore. And it's amazing to me how many people will, every time they have a challenge, will go, what have I done wrong? Well, you're living in the world. You're living in this world. So there's going to be challenges. And if you can just chalk it up to that, you can quickly focus on Jesus. But if you don't, if you can't, you know, if you don't just receive that in this world, I'm going to have troubles, but Jesus overcame them for me. If you don't quickly come to that place of rest that there's going to be times things happen in my life that I don't understand, but Jesus is here and he's overcome this for me and I have the victory in him. Then you'll stand over here in in this enslaved mentality thinking, what have I done wrong? This isn't right. Right? What do I need to do to fix it? Maybe if I had been a better parent or a better wife or a better husband or if I would have done this or that or this right or if I wouldn't have made that mistake and you stay in this mentality that it has something to do with you. When trials come to us all, it's just how we respond that determines whether we experience the inheritance or whether we live like a slave. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So what does living in freedom look like? Verse 2, Galatians chapter 5. Notice it is I, Paul, who tells you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no profit to you. For if you distrust him, you can gain nothing from him. I once more protest and testify to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation and bound to practice the whole of the law and its ordinances. The Apostle Paul is saying here that if you think that you have to add anything to the finished work of Jesus, whether it be circumcision or whatever religious good work you think you have to add to qualify for Jesus, he says Christ will profit you nothing. Everything that Jesus purchased for you will be squandered. And we're going to read that in the message. It's such a beautiful passage in the message. But he says, I once more, I once more protest and testify to every man who receives circumcision or puts himself underneath a religious rule that he is under obligation and bound to practice the whole of the law. In other words, if you're going to put yourself underneath one law, one thing that you feel like you haven't done right or you need to do right, then you have to make sure you do it all right. Every last little dot and tittle. That's what, if you want to live under the law and base your righteousness and your blessing and your favor from God based on what you do, you have to do it all right. You can't do anything wrong. Yeah, you might be faithful to church and you may be tithing, you may be giving, but did you, did you argue with your husband? Did you get impatient with your children? Did, you know what I'm saying? You, if you live underneath this law system, this religious system, then you have to make sure you do it all right. And when you understand that, you'll let go of religion. You'll let go of the law. When you really understand that no matter how good you think you are or how good you're trying to be, that you'll never, ever be good enough in your own strength by what you do. You'll never, ever be righteous enough. Never then you'll let go of it. You'll finally let go of it. See, people who are holding on to the law, they're holding on to qualifying themselves, they still think that somehow they can do it all. Because if they didn't think that, they'd let go of it. 
But the scripture says if you're going to put yourself underneath one law, circumcision is what he's talking about here. It, you put, it under, put yourself under it all and make sure you do it all right. Don't ever get angry at your husband. Don't ever get into strife. Don't ever be impatient with your children. Don't ever have a critical thought towards somebody. Don't ever be judgmental. Don't ever worry. Don't ever do anything wrong. Because under this system, if you don't do it all right, you are disqualified. You, you quit yet? Is anybody quitting yet? Is anybody giving up yet? Because when you see that, and see, that's what I saw. When I, when I first began my journey out of the law and into, into grace, the Lord showed me. He says, Connie, you're depending on everything you do to make yourself qualified for my blessing and favor. And it was true. Everything I thought, I mean, when it came to healing, finances, blessings in my marriage, uh, being confident and secure and living in joy and peace, it had everything to do with was I doing it all right. But when I realized trusting in my own ability will never make me right will never make me experience the inheritance when I really understood that I let it go. And I have never went back to it. Never. When I experience those negative emotions as we've experienced, I know where to go. I run to Jesus. I let him change the way I think. I let him strengthen me where I'm weak. I let him show me his perspective so I can live in his spirit. See, living in the flesh is just depending on your own way, depending on your own strength, depending on your own good works. Living in the Spirit is depending on His way, depending on His opinion, depending on His strength. That's it. You know, we've had a lot of messages on in the flesh, killing the flesh, and living, you know what I'm saying? And it's really, really simple. When you live in the flesh, you're dependent on yourself. When you live in the Spirit, you're dependent on Jesus. That's really simple. Yeah, it's very simple. And you can always tell when, you're, when, you've, when you've converted back to depending on yourself because these negative things start rising up in you. Yeah? I mean, you know, you start getting a little fearful. You start thinking, oh my goodness, it's not going to work out well for me. And all these negative things start coming at you. It just means you've been distracted for a moment. It's okay. Just because you can recognize it. You know, I love recognizing it. Because it makes me run back to Jesus. And then when I run back to Jesus and start talking to him about whatever's ailing me, whatever's concerning me, whatever's... He, he just works his... <laughs> he just works his supernatural power in me. It is so good. It's the life of freedom. Living free in Christ is having a personal relationship with him where he's the one you run to when you're afraid. Daddy's the one you run to when you're angry, when you're mad, when you're frustrated. He's the one you run to, not run away from. See, religion, you run away from him. Relationship, you run to him. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. You might even be angry at him. But you go and you let him know it. And you say, help me. I'm really angry right now. But you know, we stay in that state. Have you ever been angry at somebody, offended by somebody, and it just eats you? I mean, it's just like a cancer of the soul. You know, that person might not even know that they offended you. And you're over here dying, a cancer of the soul. <laughs> we all have. Have we not all been there? Come on. Anybody going to raise their hand said they've never, never been there? Because I know y'all won't raise your hand and be honest with me. So let's just, let's say, if you have never experienced cancer of the soul, I'm talking about you are just di dying on the inside because you're so frustrated and angry and mad at somebody. Somebody's offended you and you're just stewing over that thing. Has anybody in this room never done that? Okay, I want everybody to look around. Do you see any hands in the, in the air? No, because we all have. Now, the difference is some people live there. Some people only visit. <laughs> Do you hear me? Some people live there. I used to live there. 
I did. I lived in jealousy. I really was jealous of everybody. I really was. I really did get offended by people, and then I just thought, well, whatever, they think they're better than me. I did. And guess what? I never quit thinking that. I thought that all the time. There was no freedom for me because I had my focus on myself. I was a child of God. I lived like a slave. Not anymore. I found freedom in Jesus. So when those things come up in me, frustration, and they do, anger, and it does, (laughs) fear, and it comes, I just take my heart to Jesus. Work this issue out with me, Jesus. I need a heart working going on here. I need you to help me. I need you to show me. I want to live free. I want to live free. I don't want to live like that anymore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 4, if you seek to be justified and declared righteous and be given a right standing with God through the law, you are brought to nothing and separated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, from God's gracious favor and unmerited blessing. Let's read that again. If you seek to be justified and declared righteous and to be given a right standing with God through the law, through your own effort, through your own good works, through something that you do, you are brought to nothing and so separated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, from God's gracious favor and unmerited blessing. See, some people think when you hear the term fallen from grace, we've all been taught that that means somebody fell into sin. When, you fall in, when you've fallen from grace, you've fallen into sin. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says it's when you seek to be righteous through your own good works that you fall from grace. When you seek to be good in your own strength, you fall from grace. You fall out of grace. It just means that it doesn't mean you're not a Christian anymore. We know that. We're, you know, we're in Jesus and we're in Jesus. And that's all there is to it. We're in him. But what it does mean is that you started working your life in your own strength. You can't be in works and grace at the same time. They both do not operate in your heart at the same time. If you're focusing on yourself and your own effort and your own strength, that's where you're at. Because grace and works, they don't go together. So falling from grace is simply relying going back to self-effort, going back to self-reliance, going back to trying to qualify yourself. That's what it means to fall from grace. If you seek to be justified, to be favored, to be loved, to be blessed by anything that you do, then you have separated yourself from Christ. Now, does Jesus still live in you? Yes, he does. So separating yourself from Christ means, okay, Jesus, I, I got this. I got this. I'll take care of this. Yeah. Now, let's see the other way to live. For we, now this is the children of the free, for we, not relying on the law, not relying upon our effort to obey the law, not relying upon our strength to to work things out, to make things right, not trying to earn God's favor by something that we do, For we, not relying on the law, but through the Holy Spirit's help, by faith, which means relying upon Jesus, we anticipate and wait for the blessing and good for which our righteousness and right standing with God causes us to hope. So the children of the free, if you're living free in Christ, then you with the holy, not relying upon yourself, not relying upon your own strength or your own ability, but through the Holy Spirit's help by relying upon Jesus, you anticipate, look for, enjoy the glory of God. Your whole life. I mean, for me, it's like I'm constantly looking for the, I'm just constantly looking for the glory of God. I mean, I mean, some of the my minute little things in my life, I'm like, oh, that was Jesus. Oh, that was God. Where some people won't even recognize it. 
You know what the difference is? Because they're still over here in the mindset of the flesh, depending on themselves, depending on how they can work it out. And when you're over here relying upon Jesus, talking to Jesus, I mean, you see him everywhere. I mean, you see him in every situation. I mean, I'll just give you a, a minute little bitty story, okay? I mean, it's not even that big of a deal, but how my mind just goes, Jesus, you love me so much. One day, I was running late. I was running late to, to take a, a letter to the post office that needed to be out on that day. It needed to be out in the mail that day, postmarked that day, okay? So I'm running late to get to the post office to get it in the mail by time. I get to the post office, and I'm digging through my purse to get money for a stamp. I am one penny short, okay? Now, what do you think started trying to come at me? Anxiety and fear try to try to, to grab me because I'm like, it's not going to happen. I'm one penny short. I'm not going to be able to get this letter in the mail in time. And just as I thought that, I turned my thoughts to Jesus. I said, Jesus, help me. I need your help right now. That's all. I just need your help right now. One penny. <laughs> and as I look across the floor, over in the corner lies one penny. One penny. See, that penny for me that day was Jesus loves me. This I know, for the penny showed me so. You know, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about these little, I mean, you're going through life. See, somebody else would have just, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get it. You know, run out the door, try to get their penny somewhere else. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Trying to save yourself. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know, maybe, who knows what you would have thought of doing. Or you can in the moment say, Jesus, I need your help right now. I need your help. Help me in this situation. Guess what came when I started looking to Jesus? Peace. I, w I started enjoying my inheritance. My inheritance is peace in every situation. And then guess what? My need was met. One penny. For some people, that would be no big deal for me. It's enjoying and walking and living in the glory of God. Seeing him show up over and over and over in just the little areas. From the big to the little, he's going to take care of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. We, by faith, see that little story? was an example of anticipating and waiting for the good for which our righteousness causes us to hope. How did I have a confident expectation that God was going to help me in that one little situation? Because I knew he'd made me righteous. I knew Jesus loved me. I knew that I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, before in my life, I would have probably not even asked because I wouldn't have thought he would have helped me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. If I would have been more organized and prepared and not running late that day, then I wouldn't have found myself in this predicament. See? Or you can just, not, I mean, that stuff just doesn't, it just, it, it's not about whether you've done it all right. It's not about if you've, you know, you, it's not about that I waited till the last second and I procrastinated to get that letter in the mail. It was about at that moment Jesus was there to help me, to provide for me, to give me peace in a time that could have caused me anxiety. Because I asked. That's as simple as it gets, isn't it? Simple as it gets. Thank you, Jesus. For we, for we, no, for if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. Any. It just means there's no good work you can do or can't do, no religious system, rule that you need to follow or not follow. It counts for nothing. It does, none of that matters. What matters? But only faith relying upon Jesus, activated and energizing and expressed and working through love. Now, I'm going to talk about that for just, in just a second, but I want you to hear this in the Message Bible. We're going to read Galatians 5, 1 through 6 in the Message Bible. Christ has set us free to live a free life, so take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. I am emphatic about this. The moment any one of you submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment, Christ's hard-won 
gift of freedom is squandered. I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the ways of circumcision trades all the advantages of the free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. I suspect you would never intend this, but this is what happens. When you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you are cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. It means it's nothing. What matters is something far more interior. Isn't that beautiful? What matters is something far more interior, faith or relying upon Jesus expressed in love. Now, you know, I used to look at the scripture and think that the only thing that matters is that I walk in love. You know, but no, and we're going to see that again as we go farther down in Galatians. It's, it's talking about faith that arises out of knowing that you're loved. I mean, what was this passage of scripture talking about anyway? So it's talking about the favor and blessing of God not coming through your seeking to be justified by the law, but by the Spirit, by relying upon Jesus, by receiving his gift of righteousness, you anticipate and you look for and you expect the glory of God to show up in your life because you've been made righteous in Jesus, not because of all the things that you've done. That is an expression of God's love. The only thing that matters is that, is that faith that works by you knowing that you're loved. You know, it's so interesting underneath the law, we're all focused on walk in love, walk in love, walk in love. And there's not going to be any walking in love until you receive love. It's impossible to love somebody that's not kind and nice to you without the grace of God, without his love working in you. The only thing that matters in this life of freedom is relying upon Jesus that comes by understanding and revelation of his love. You're not going to trust him if you don't know he loves you. You're not going to trust him if you don't think he's going to work all things together for your good. You're not going to trust him. Is it true? You're not really going to trust him if you don't think his plan is to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. You're not going to trust him if you don't think he's going to take care of your children. You're not going to trust him if you don't know that he loves you. And that he proved it by making you righteous, not by the law, but by his gift of grace. The only thing that matters in this life of freedom is faith relying upon Jesus. That works. That works by love. Knowing his perfect Love. What casts out fear? Perfect love. What's the opposite of fear? Huh? What's the opposite of fear, worry, concern? Trust Trust and rely upon Jesus. Yes. Fear, faith. Fear, faith. What casts out fear? Love. Love and faith. (laughs) The only way we're really going to start resting and trusting in him is a revelation of his love. And the only way we're going to get a revelation of love is stay in communion with him because he's our teacher and he's going to show us. The scripture says he's going to teach you and give you great peace and you'll become established in righteousness and fear won't even come near you. That's Isaiah 54. The Holy Spirit will be your teacher. And you will enjoy great peace. What's he going to teach you? His love, how much he loves you, what he's done for you in Christ. That is an expression of God's love. Everything that has been provided for us in Jesus, it says that in Romans 8, 39, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the full expression of of the Father's 
love. You think you're getting it. That's awesome. <laughs> so the only thing that matters is not that you're trying to follow a bunch of religious rules. Not that you're trying to measure up to the five steps of whatever you're trying to get. The only thing that matters is that you learn how much Jesus loves you. The only thing that matters is that you live and rest and abide in his love. Because as you do, as you grow and learn and, and understand his love for you, faith is a fruit. It's a fruit of love. It's fruit of his love working in us. The spirit of God revealing Jesus to us. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 7 through 11. The Apostle Paul again warns us against false teaching. He's doing that a lot in Galatians. You were running the race nobly. Who has interfered and hindered and stopped you from heeding and following the truth? Okay, you were running the race nobly. You had your eyes on Jesus. You were living free in his love. You understood that he made you righteous, that you were perfect and complete in him. Who has interfered in and stopped you from following the truth? This evil persuasion is not from him who called you, who invited you to freedom in Christ. A little leaven, a slight inclination to error, or a few false teachers leavens the whole lump. It perverts the whole conception of faith and misleads the whole church. Did you see that? A little leaven, a little doo-doo. A little doo-doo. Just a little bit of it. A little bit of human effort. A little bit of what you got to do to please God. Perverts the whole message the whole conception of relying upon Jesus. It, 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 you, I could teach you half a message of you're righteous in Christ. You are righteous in Christ. And the other half go back to, but these are the things you need to do if you want to please God. And I perverted the whole message of you're righteous in Christ. I, it misleads the whole church. Isn't that amazing that that's in the Bible? Just a little leaven, just a little doo-doo. Just a little pointing you to yourself misleads the whole church, perverts the whole message. It's all about Jesus. It's all about relying on him, believing who you are in him, who he is in your life. It's all about Jesus. It's not about us and what we have to do, 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 do. Do you all believe that? Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 10. For my part, I have confidence toward you. I love that. He says, for my part, I have confidence toward you in the Lord that you will take no contrary view of the matter, but will come to think with me. Isn't that good? But he who is unsettling you, whoever he is, will have to bear the penalty. But brethren, if I still preach circumcision, as some accuse me of doing, is necessary to salvation, why am I still suffering persecution? In that case, the cross has ceased to be a stumbling block and made meaningless, done away. I wish those who unsettle and confuse you would go all the way and cut themselves off. Wow. You just wanted them to whack it off. Anyway... <laughs> oh my goodness I can't believe I said that in that case that's right he did say it didn't he in that case the cross has ceased to be a stumbling block I, and it, it's made meaningless and done away the moment somebody adds to the, the cross of Christ the finished work of Jesus it becomes meaningless I mean if we could, um, you know what I'm saying? We are done with religion. We are done with it. Religion is a bunch of do's that you got to do to find favor with God. Religion is causing people to 
be on different levels because of how much good they do, how much bad they don't, you know, how much judging, judging and measuring one another based on our good behavior or our bad behavior. That's what religion is in a nutshell. It, the gospel's not about that. It's about a Savior, Jesus, who came to make us all equal with him as a gift by faith. If we believe that, we'll have peace in every situation of our lives, knowing that he's going to work it out for our good. Amen? Amen. True freedom is a life of love. I love this. Verse 13. For if you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom, only do not let your freedom be an incentive for your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness. But through love you should serve one another. For the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled with this one precept, you shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. But if you bite and devour one another in strife, be careful that you and your whole fellowship are not consumed by one another. Now I'm going to read this in the Message Bible. Verse 13 through 15, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to sin, basically is what he's saying, to live in sin, to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Isn't that interesting? People who use their freedom, you are free in Christ. You are righteous in Christ, not based on what you do or what you don't do. But if you take that freedom and say that I'm free to live in sin, you destroy your freedom. Isn't that that is the true gospel of grace. That is the whole concept of, of what's true. And all the people out there that are saying it's okay to live in some kind of lifestyle that is, is sinful because of grace and because righteousness is a free gift, they're destroying their freedom. Freedom was not given to us to destroy our lives by doing whatever we want to do. Freedom was given to us so we could find our identity in Christ, so we could know that we're loved and approved and qualified. And so out of that place of security, love is birthed. Love comes forth. We love each other. It says don't use your, your uh, freedom as an excuse to be selfish. It, it's kind of back to the giving thing. You know, yes, you're free. You're not under a law. You're not under a law to tithe and to give and to earn God's blessing through what you do, but don't use that as an excuse not to give at all and destroy your freedom. That's not freedom. Freedom is to be able to give joyfully. That's freedom. That's a life of freedom because the only reason why you hold on to what you got is because you're afraid you won't have enough. And that ain't freedom. I'm going to say it again. The only reason you hold on to what you got it's because you're afraid you don't have enough. If you're really free, if you really believe you're righteous and you're qualified and you're blessed, you'll be giving as the Spirit leads you. All the time you'll be giving. You'll be giving to this person when they need something. And, you know, as the Spirit leads you. I'm not telling you you have to meet everybody's needs either. So we don't want to get in bondage about that either. You know? True? I mean, then we can take, oh, I didn't give to that lady yesterday. I'm in bondage. No. If the, I mean, there are times to give and there's times not to give. I, I live in this life of freedom and there's times the Lord puts in my heart to give and bless people and there's other times it says, I got somebody else to do it this time, Connie. And you know what that does? It keeps people from looking to you. That's what it does. If you live in the Spirit and listen to what He tells you and give when He tells you to give and, and don't give when He tells you not to. <laughs> it's, it's true and it's freedom. Because you're going to give joyfully. When you're given because the Spirit of God is prompting you and leading you, it's joyful. It is a joyful experience. When you're giving just because you feel like you have to, or it, it's not a joyful experience. So I tell you what, you know, any time I see a need, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Any time I see a need, any time an offering is given, I always just ask the Lord, what would you have me give? And you know, you might think he says yes every time. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says, no, that's for you. It's, this is for you. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't want us to give all our money away and not enjoy our own lives. That's what I did when I was under the law. I mean, I gave every last dime I had, trying to earn the favor of God. So I'm not going to be free and then give every last dime I have, you know, to be poor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you live in the freedom of it doesn't matter what people think. I'm going to tell you another story. This is just, 
The beauty of living in the freedom of what God thinks, of what God says. Freedom from what anybody thinks or judges you. It doesn't matter what they think. I was sitting in a church service one time, and there was this offering given. And it, to me, it was the most manipulated, manipulated thing. I, Connie is not going to be manipulated to give. I am free. Do you understand? <laughs> So if I feel manipulation, you ain't getting a dime. Okay, so I'm sitting in this service, and these people are saying how much money they need for their project they're doing, and that's fine. And if you give the people freedom, they want to give, give. If you don't want to give, don't. But this is what happened. Who's going to give 100? Who's going to give 1,000? Who's going to give 50? And they all started, you know, when your money amount came up, you were supposed to stand up to show everybody in the room how much money you were giving. And you know what? I, I was in a place where I could have really given, given good to this, this situation, but my butt stayed on the chair. <laughs> and by the end of this thing, there were only a few people sitting down and everybody else was standing up. And I just looked around and I thought, how sad. We're still living under manipulation and control because if you don't stand up, you look like you're selfish. You look like you don't want to help. You look like I didn't care what anybody thought. I was going to live in the freedom that I have in Jesus and nobody was going to manipulate me to give. And my husband felt the same way, me and him. We were two of the handful of people and hundreds, maybe I don't know how many people were there that day, a lot that were sitting on our butts. And that's freedom. That is a life of freedom. We, you know, it it wasn't that we didn't give it all to this place that we went. We did. When our hearts were led to give, we gave. We gave joyfully. We gave lots. But on that particular day, in that arena, when manipulation and control came in its ugly head, somebody was trying to put me back under bondage and slavery. I said, no. No, I will be led by the Spirit. I will not give because of men's approval or disapproval. I'm going to give out of the freedom that Jesus has given to me. I'm telling you what. Are you listening? Because you can live free. You can live free. It doesn't matter what people think. You are You are loved. You are loved. And you are a giver. But you are led by the Spirit. And the only thing that matters is faith relying upon Jesus that is expressed through knowing He loves you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Oh, dear Lord. Okay. So don't, so don't use our freedom as an excuse to be selfish, but through love, serve one another. I love, did we re- read all of the message? Let me see. I don't think we did. I think it got stopped here. I'm reading it again. The Message Bible, Galatians chapter 5, 13 through 15. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. How do you love yourself? Yes, by knowing how much Jesus loves you. We don't love anybody when we don't love ourselves. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time, all you will be... All you will, at all, in no time at all, you will be each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? Isn't that interesting? You know, when I was reading that scripture, I was thinking about the division that comes in doctrines. I was thinking about, you know, we, when, when grace becomes a doctrine and not a relationship, when grace, you just went from the faith doctrine to the grace doctrine to the whatever other doctrine, it's just a doctrine to you, it creates division. And we aim, what's that word? Well, that's what I'm 
trying to say? Alienate. We separate and we start judging each other because I know the grace message and you don't. You know? Rather than just living out, if we're really living in grace, if we're really living in that place, we love people to the grace of God. People who aren't in the law, we just keep loving them. Not in our own strength, not in our own power, because sometimes we want to knock them over the head and knock some sense into them. Right? Not in our own strength. If we're in our own strength, we want to separate ourselves. We, we, we start being judgmental because they don't know what we know. They're in the wrong doctrine and we're in the right doctrine. And we're right back in religion. And we call it grace. Do you hear what I'm saying? Okay. True grace. God's grace working in our hearts unites us. It unites us. It doesn't matter if somebody believes the law. It doesn't matter if what they believe or what they don't believe. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. The only thing that matters is that we live in a relationship with Jesus where we're receiving his love and his love is flowing out of us. That's a life of freedom. That's what freedom looks like, is that we're trusting and relying upon Jesus for everything that we need. And in that place of security, love just comes forth. And there are times, I know for me, I mean, just not too long ago, I had somebody say something that wasn't very kind to my son, one of my older sons, and, and it wasn't very nice. And for a moment, I sat there and thought for a second, why would they act like that? Why would they say that to him? That wasn't very nice. That's not grace. You know, the critical, judgmental thoughts started coming. You know, I can't even believe they talk about grace. They don't even know how to live in grace. You know, yeah. do you hear what I'm saying? And I'm, and I'm going through this, this negative emotions towards this person. And what do I do? <laughs> it's not the same story I tell you every time. Because it's, I don't have any other story. I don't. So if you want a new story about not running to Jesus, go listen to Mr. Joe down the street. I don't know. But if you want to live in freedom, you turn back to Jesus. You and so what I did was, I'm serious, I was having this negative emotions going in my heart, thinking negative thoughts. Ain't, I can't say that word, but thinking about the fence going up. You know? And I just said, Jesus, Jesus, it's not who I am. You made me righteous. You set me free. Help me. Help me to see this through your eyes. Help me to love the way you love. Remind me who I am. So I'm, I mean, and this isn't just a moment. You know, I only have a moment to share with you this story. But I worked through this with Jesus. You know, yes. I talked with him. I asked him to help me and show me why he was bothering me. And, and he shows you. He shows you. And it's always a lie. It's always something that, you know, well, what, you know, what does that person think of my son? Why, is, why did they act like that to him? You know, are they thinking badly of him? you see what I'm saying? Why do I care what they think about my son? He's wonderful and blessed. He's blessed and favored of God. Who cares whether somebody thought he was great or not? Does that make sense? And so when I realized, it's like, okay. And then I realized, and it's, this is the thoughts that went through my head. Jesus started helping with my mind, my thoughts. And I started thinking about that person must, you know, there must be a hurt in their heart. They must have had a bad day. Maybe something happened to them that day and it just caused them to react like that. You see what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, compassion starts rising up in your heart towards the very person that acted ugly to your child because you don't know what they're dealing with. But if I stayed in this mindset of how could they act that way? What, why are they acting that way? I can't believe they said that to my son. Then I'm, I'm staying in this slave bondage mentality and it's that cancer of the soul I'm destroying my freedom so if we want to live free we have to take every negative emotion every negative feeling to Jesus and let him work that out in our lives and he will and it's freedom Amen. true freedom is loving others as you love yourself. Loving others the way God loves you. Loving others the way God has given you love. That's true freedom. 
to be able to come into the presence of this person and just feel love and compassion and genuine love is freedom. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. All right, we're almost done here. Jesus, help me. Two ways to live in the flesh or in the spirit. The result of living by our own human effort versus the fruit of a life lived in grace. But I say walk and live in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. For these are against each other, continually withstanding and in conflict with each other, so that you are not free, but are pre prevented from doing what you desire to do. But if you are guided, led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the doings of the flesh are clear. They are immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, anger, jealousy, division, selfishness, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you beforehand, just as I did before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which His presence within accomplishes, is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and appetites and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited, com competitive and challenging and provoking and irritating to one another, envying and being jealous of one another. Now listen to this in the Message Bible. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzing and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming all yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit, habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives much the same way that fruit appears on an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, a conviction that a basic holiness perme permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments and needing and not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold, hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us was better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Isn't that beautiful in the message, Bible? Living in the flesh is simply relying upon yourself instead of Jesus. It's taking on your own opinion of, instead of agreeing with the Father's good opinion of you in Christ. Now, I want this is what living in the flesh, depending on yourself and your own opinion, produces. And I just listed it out. This is the kind of life that relying upon yourself, living under the law, trying to be good in your own strength, this is what it produces. Immorality, idolatry, strife. Jealousy, anger, selfishness, division, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. 
such as fear, anxiety, insecurity, confusion, resentment, unforgiveness, guilt, and shame, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, and impotence to love or be loved, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrolled addiction, uncontrollable addictions, vainglorious and self-conceit, comparing yourself as better or worse than someone else. That's the kind of life. That's, that's the slave life. That's the kind of life that produces out of depending on your own strength, depending on yourself, living in the flesh. Remember, living in the flesh is simply depending on your self-effort. Living in the Spirit is simply depending and relying upon Jesus. The Scripture says those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that they're not saved. I mean, we know this is true from the prodigal son story. I mean, he, he didn't walk in the ways of his father. He left his father and his relationship with his father to live his own, in his own opinion and his own strength. And where did it get him? Pig. To the pig pen. He found himself in want. He found himself in guilt and shame and condemnation and abandoned and lonely. He wasn't experiencing his inheritance which is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. It says those who live in the flesh will never experience the kingdom of God. Now, I know some people say, well, you live in the kingdom of God. Well, I want to experience it. Yeah, Yeah, of course. Jesus rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of God. But if I'm still dealing with fear and anxiety and unforgiveness and resentment, I enjoy no inheritance in the kingdom of God. I'm not experiencing joy, peace, and the Holy Spirit. So it's saying those who do these things, those who produce those things, as a result of relying upon your flesh, trying to work out your own life, trying to protect yourself, provide for yourself, do everything for yourself, find favor, those who live that way are going to have this kind of life. Do we want to forsake it yet? Forsake it. Forsake it. That's what it's going to produce in the pig pen kind of life. A king, a beloved, approved, chosen, forgiven, qualified child of God living in the pig pen. That's what it produces. So, but when we live in the spirit, which simply means rely upon Jesus, receive his his power, his strength. Believe what he says about you. Then what kind of life does that produce? Okay, let's look. This is what living in the spirit, relying upon Jesus, agreeing with him produces. Love, affection for others, joy, gladness, exuberance about life. I love that. You're just loving life. You just love life. When you start relying upon Jesus, begin embracing your identity in him, begin going to him when you have fearful thoughts or or negative emotions, you begin to be exuberant about life. I mean, you begin to go, oh my goodness, look what's coming out in my life and it's not from my own human effort anymore. This is the spirit of God working in me. This is the spirit of God loving through me. This is the spirit of God giving through me. This is the spirit of God self-control working in me. See, grace produces freedom, and freedom looks like love, affection for others, joy, peace, serenity, patience, a willingness to stick with things, kindness, a sense of compassion in the heart, goodness, a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things in people, faithfulness. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, gentleness, meekness, humility, not needing to force our our own way. Not needing to force our own way. Oh my goodness, I could tell you another story, but I don't have time. So I'm going to have to hold it for another time. But I'm telling you what, when you understand that you're loved, you don't have to force your own way anymore. I used to fight so much with my husband trying to get my own way because I didn't know who I was. I was living in the flesh, trying to get what I wanted, what I wanted by the flesh and by the strength of my own arm. And then I learned to live in Christ. I learned that when my husband disagreed with me about something that I, that I wanted or that I, you know, just something, 
All I need to do is go with Jesus. I didn't have to fight with him. I didn't have to try to get him to see it my way, to get him to... Do you know that's just... Oh, it's the pig pen life. I don't want to live there anymore. So now when I have a disagreement, I'll come over to Jesus and I'll say, Jesus, I just had a situation happen like this not too long ago. I come over here to Jesus. I know you want to give me the desire of my heart. You said the desire of the righteous would be granted. And I just thank you that in your way and in your timing, you will give me the desire of my heart. I don't have to fight. I don't have to get in strife. You love me. And you're going to work out your good plan for me. See, then I have peace. I can love my husband because he's not keeping something from me. That I, Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't have to fight and strive. I can live over here in this place of the Spirit where I'm relying upon Jesus, where I'm trusting in his love, where I have peace, and I can watch him work the situation out for my good. Amen? I'm so excited to share with you about the release of our new Because of Jesus ministry app. When you open the app, you'll find our homepage with our main content. For example, simply click Watch Weekly Broadcast and you'll be able to watch or listen to each week of my current Bible study on my YouTube ministry channel. You can join us live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central or listen anytime after it's aired at your convenience. You can even click Cast to your TV on the video of each week's message and lead a home Bible study with a group of friends. By clicking Bible Study Notes, you will find the notes or book that goes with the current weekly Bible study. One of the most exciting features is by simply clicking on audio or video Bible study series, you can listen to all the Bible studies I've taught over the last 10 years. Every CD and DVD series in our online bookstore is now available to listen to or watch for free. That's $1,100 worth of free products just by downloading the app. Click Resources and New Releases and you can purchase any Bible study or book in our ministry online bookstore. Click the Women of Grace icon and you can watch the Women of Grace TV programs, register to attend a conference, listen to the conference messages, connect with us through email sign up, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter. Click Donate to easily support the ministry of Because of Jesus. Simply enter the amount you want to give and choose the one-time donation or become a monthly partner. This ministry app is made available by the continual support of the partners of Because of Jesus. I pray it is a blessing to you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today for Bible study. If you were blessed by today's message, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so that you will be notified every time new content is uploaded. Have a blessed day.